I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to moderate our panel. I'm Rosalind Layton. I have a think tank called China Tech Threat, and I'm a researcher at uh, Alberg University in Copenhagen. And let me introduce our panelists today. We have um, Jeff Kane, who is a fellow at Lincoln Network. Um, he has a, a also writes for Wired. You can check out a really amazing interview he did in Ukraine in March of this year with Zelensky. So um, we have also Julius Krein, who worked in the finance industry um, and then went to found a journal called American Affairs. We also have Dustin Carmack from the Heritage Institute. Um, he worked in American government in uh, the office of the Director of National Intelligence. He's worked for members of Congress and um, now is at Heritage. So let's have this discussion. I'm gonna kick off here with maybe having our panelists give a um, definition of industrial policy. So um, who would like to start? Or maybe we'll start with you, Dustin, You're gonna, and we'll work this way. Do you have a definition of industrial policy? Yeah, I mean, it's mixed. I mean, Jeff and you know, they, they may be able to give you a better description because I've never been a big fan of industrial policy. <laughs> um, but generally, it's been viewed as you know government incentive patterns uh, for something uh, for you know an area of focus, either economically or national security wise, uh, that you're trying to, to essentially drive the market into matching a need. Um, and I think the our you know history as a country has a very scattered history of, of effect in this and, and coming from working on Capitol Hill where I you know was a while ago, uh, Congress just has a very uh, disincentivized pattern in, in terms of how they weigh into this and I think the executive branch as well is not well suited at times to, to really target uh, these different types of incentives and it does create uh, different market effects that really uh, sometimes are good and, and like uh, you know most recently here you know we'll be probably talking about the CHIPS Act. Uh, which recently passed, you know, is a good example of this, of kind of a re-engaging of our country to, to be able to go after, you know, uh, reduction in our manufacturing base as it relates to fabrication of semiconductors. Um, now, I have a question of if the Department of Commerce is the best suited at uh, as putting that program together, and I think they are even struggling to figure out how that's going to go about. Uh, so I'll leave it there and I'll probably toss it over to Jeff. Thank you. Dustin. Thank you, Dustin. Um, so industrial policy, uh, the way I see it, it is a rethink of um, this idea of the perfectly free market that is always going to act in our interests. Um, industrial policy is an approach that looks at certain sectors, cer certain uh, critical sectors, so semiconductors, uh, steel, displays, um, you know, military weaponry and components, um, these are critical sectors and they are not treated as mere profit-making institutions. The purpose of industrial policy is to use the state, state resources and state sovereignty uh, to guide these particular critical industries in the right direction to ensure that they're serving the interests of the country and not merely the interests of a few shareholders or a corporate boardroom. Um, there are much bigger issues at stake. And so what's happened, um, you know, and this is a, a common narrative, common storyline uh, that I think we've talked about a little bit earlier today too. There's been a hollowing out, the financialization of the market in the age of globalization in the past 30 years. And really all industrial policy is, is a corrective to that um, more laissez-faire policy to ensure that we're not hollowing out the important parts too that we really need um, to ensure that our nation is defended and protected. Uh, I'll pass it to you, Julius. Uh, sure, yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, the, the definition of industrial policy is perhaps very simple. It's just the identification and promotion of strategic sectors. Uh, and then this is where the complication starts. Um, the execution, of course, is very difficult. But I think what is interesting about the U.S. discourse on this topic is, one, there's this notion that you, there's such a thing as not having an industrial policy. Whereas um, when other countries have industrial policies and you're trading with them, um, you have one whether you like it or not. And what we have now is essentially just the inverse of China's industrial policy. Other countries too, but, but China above all. Um, and there's also a curious disconnect, I think, in the way you, government, corporate, 
uh, relations have gone in the US recently is we basically pretend that we're doing level playing field stuff and then we have a crisis and then we do a rushed bailout um, and there's all kinds of problems with that as opposed to kind of proactively and productively thinking through how this is going to work because, oh, that's scary, that could be industrial policy. Um, and last but not least, we have a weird disconnect at the, between sort of the federal and the state level. At the state and local level, all this stuff is actively encouraged by pretty much everyone. There isn't a state governor around who doesn't say, I'm going to bring high value uh, industries and jobs to the state, and that's a good thing. Um, but at the federal level, for whatever reason, we have a hard time talking about that. Um, but unfortunately, again, other countries, uh, including many of our competitors, uh, are not so scrupulous. So, well, thank you all for that. I think you can see that this is a very rich area for discussion. I'll throw out my own interpretation of this. It goes back to the father of tech, American tech policy, Alexander Hamilton, who in 1795 was doing the inventory of the manufacturers. And the policy was, we're going to become an industrial nation. We're not going to import finished goods from England. Um, we are going to make, we're going to have machines and we're going to produce things. And by the way, that will end slavery. We will not have to have slaves doing uh, uh, labor that way. We're going to have the machines do the labor. So one could say we've had this idea from the founding. You could even argue there's constitutional notions and so on. But so now we've got that. There's now a concept you can hear throughout today. We've talked about manufacturing and reindustrialization. And if you go to today's Wall Street Journal, you're going to see an article from Jeff where he's reviewing this exciting new book called The Titanium Economy. And maybe, Jeff, that you could tell us about that. But titanium economy sounds like a good example of what reindustrialization means. So. Yes, so um, the titanium economy, I would absolutely recommend this book to anyone who wants to uh, read after the event. Um, I just reviewed it this morning in the Wall Street Journal. It's a book by three McKinsey consultants uh, who traveled through the country and, and looked at some of the major uh, technological advances underway in 3D printing, um, advanced materials, uh, recycling and environmental technology, um, and a few other areas, so machine learning, cloud, uh, cloud computing, and so forth. Um, and they came to the conclusion, they, they studied a, a whole raft of, of just interesting American companies that have um, really come out of nowhere in the past 10 years and come to dominate um, this relatively young field in America called advanced manufacturing. Um, advanced manufacturing means, you know, it, 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 uh, it means what it implies, which is the use of robotics, the use of um, AI and so forth to, to try to increase productivity, to, uh, um, you know, to, to design more advanced uh, products, things that cannot be made in China and cannot be made in Vietnam because they're high up the value chain and they have much more value to both consumers and investors. Um, so many of these companies, uh, you know, th this is an exploding field right now um, that it also has much government support with the Chips and Science Act. Um, one of the uh, corporate examples that they give is um, a company called, um, uh, you know, the, the name escapes me, uh, and I wish I could say it because their share price has exploded by 5,000% in the past six years. Um, and they're, they're posting returns that rival um, some of the FANG companies. Apparently, this is what they write about. Uh, yes, this is Heiko. Heiko. Yes, yes, based in Florida, Heiko. Um, you know, th these are other companies that have arisen outside of the usual Silicon Valley um, kind of software ecosystem and are typically often based in places like North Carolina, the Research Triangle, um, Virginia, Indiana, uh, Ohio. Um, there truly is a, um, a renaissance that I believe is starting now in middle America that comes from the result of um, some of these, these geopolitical struggles with China, the realization that we have to have advanced manufacturing or else we're going to lose those battles, um, but also uh, numerous technological advances that have been brewing for a while. Um, 3D printing is a great example. It's, it's always been there and we haven't really been sure totally what it's capable of. It was typically used by tinkerers in the basement who want to, uh, you know, make ex experiment with some cool new thing. Uh, but now it is being applied, uh, applied to industrial applications in uh, aeronautics and other fields, um, which is significant because it lowers costs. It, it, uh, it goes around the need for a complex supply chain. You can make one component with a, with a 3D printer now that previously required 10 components imported from eight different countries. Um, and so I think there's gonna be a lot of action in this field in the, in the years to come. Certainly something, I know there are many um, startup investors here, certainly an area to look at if you're interested in manufacturing.
Yeah, just to pick up on that, there was something like 4,000 small to mid-cap companies having returns, as you said, rivaling big tech, and being able to drive something like 15 to 20 percent efficiency improvement to EBITDA. So it's very exciting, but not on the map because it's privately owned, and um, also it doesn't fit a media narrative of like the Dust Bowl, right? So, well, um, I'm going to turn to you, Dustin, um, because you, you did reference uh, our semiconductors or the CHIPS Act, a CHIPS Plus Act. Maybe you'll tell us exactly what it's called. But you've done a lot of great stories on this, uh, on your, uh, on your uh, I don't know what to call it, uh, for heritage. You go in quite detail of the various policies. So, you know, we've had successes and failures. So why don't you give us your assessment of that act and, you know, our semiconductor policy in general? Yeah, you really have to kind of go back a few years, uh, actually, when the saga began. But quickly, I mean, we, recogni we recognized a problem, um, um, you know, several years ago that essentially the preponderance of fabrication that had been essentially pushed out of the United States, pushed out of other areas of the world, had been pushed primarily into East Asia, uh, especially in Taiwan, TSMC, great, great company that does a lot of amazing work, everything that's in your Apple iPhone and, and, and uh, et cetera, uh, they do a lot of this. And so, you know, that has been, and Taiwan had done essentially industrial policy to build that capability where they can, they can turn and burn on building a, uh, a fab in, in less than two years, uh, which this is you know, something we could talk about a little bit too, is what, you know, I worry about the CHIPS Act, which, you know, essentially spent about $80 billion between this tax credit and direct subsidies uh, to essentially promote and help uh, some major companies uh, be able to, you know, push to build fabs here that essentially were you know, economically disadvantaged versus what, you know, say China and Taiwan offer. Um, but we are not really essentially tackling the questions of what is causing our problems here at home. Uh, that some of those are workforce issues. I heard somebody mention that earlier, just about what we need to be doing as a country, both either on immigration, but also our workforce issues. Uh, but separate of that, um, you know, where we go on spending, you know, this $52 billion uh, is gonna be key. I mean, and, and what we essentially saw was, and this is, a, we, Jeff and I talk about this a lot. You know, I, I think a lot of things in the terms of the China threat. And so, you know, made in China 2025, was not just semiconductors that China wants to lead on. It was 10, at least 10 technology corridors that they want to lead on. Everything from biotechnology, artificial intelligence, you know, all these other areas. And what essentially you saw was this uh, push by semiconductor lobby and everybody else. They spent over 200, 300 million dollars over the last two years to get this across the finish line. And right now, Intel just announced yesterday after getting essentially what they will probably get as a largest share of this money they announced that they're going to be cutting thousands of jobs at Intel, uh, probably announced here in a few weeks at their, at their Q3 report. And so I'm not saying that the demand for, for chips is going to go away. It's only going to go up. Uh, but when you talk about government getting involved, you know, the problem is it's not just the United States that's getting involved in this. The EU, the South Koreans, the Japanese. And it gets really hard in terms of determining in a very tight margin sector the demand supply factor of chips. And so I worry a little bit that we're not looking at this, you know, chips plus science as, a, you know, I, will it have a net positive effect? Yes. Do I think it will have all the effects that it could have if it had been thought out more properly and not been essentially put through the political sausage grinder? Yes. So I'm going to turn to Julius for a moment, but just to maybe recap here what Dustin's saying, you know, we have this idea of carrots and sticks and your industry gets 80, 90 billion dollars. Well, what do we get? We're the taxpayers. Um, Julius has an excellent uh, article in American Affairs where he talks about uh, how the chips fell. And, you know, I think you yourself being in the finance industry, you know, you have a novel idea. Well, what if venture capitalists manage this money? I mean, maybe they would be better about sorting out the carrots and sticks. Um, well, before I get to that, I, I want to take a step back and actually... In, in talking about the Chips and Science Act, I think it's important to understand the motivations behind it. And there were really two. One of them was this kind of competition with China. U.S. Uh, share of, of semiconductor manufacturing has gone from nearly 40% to barely above 10% uh, over the last two decades. Um, we're at a point where if there were a serious issue with China, we, we probably couldn't produce even the, the basic stuff to keep our military operating. That was certainly one motivation. The other motivation that gets much less attention 
is um, within the chip industry itself. The entire point of being a fabless semiconductor company is that you can push all of the costs and risks of manufacturing onto what are seen as sort of commodity fabs. Um, but when you've reached a point where TSMC is the only company that can produce a lot of these chips, uh, it's not commodity manufacturing anymore. They're a monopoly and they exert a lot of power. So over the last couple of years or so, you've seen TSMC be, be able to enforce increasingly onerous contract terms on the likes of NVIDIA, et cetera, requiring big upfront commitments, um, you know, large, large deposits, really pushing a lot of the risk that's supposed to be in the, in the you know, 90s version of this model was supposed to be passed on to the commodity manufacturer. That's now being pushed back on to the chip designers like NVIDIA. And, and in a, for the Semiconductor Industry Association, that was much more important, really, than any of the China stuff. And so what you saw from their perspective, uh, and, and a lot of people commented on this, you know, why is NVIDIA so excited about this bill that's going to give Intel most of the money? And the reason is because they sort of need Intel to succeed so they can make this or return this to a more commodity manufacturing type of financial arrangement. Uh, so that was really their motivation um, from the beginning. And water, you know, any conditions around investing in China or jobs and uh, buybacks and dividends and all that, they were never, they never really cared about much of that. And, and that's what you saw in the final bill. So I think that's in understanding the reality of what, when ha what happened with chips and what it became, I think it's important to understand where the industry's motivation was, where maybe the kind of political intellectual motivation was, and a very narrow part where they intersected, but uh, no one really quite understood it that well. Um, in terms of, to your question more directly, um, you know, I, it's also important to recognize that just giving money to companies is kind of the most primitive form of industrial policy. Uh, other countries are much further ahead. And successful industrial policies in general involve uh, a sort of market competition element. A in a lot of the Asian cases, that was um, if the company is doing well on the global export market, if they're increasing share, then they get more support. If they do not do well in that market, they, you know, they cut off, so you're not just supporting zombie companies. Um, that doesn't necessarily make sense for the US, uh, but what would is another, th another model that's been used in places like Singapore and Israel, uh, where the government, instead of funding the companies directly, they fund investors uh, and, and basically give them a mandate to invest in certain key domestic sectors. And I think that could be a very attractive option here. I don't know if it would actually work for chip manufacturing specifically. Chip manufacturing is one of those areas just because it's so heavily subsidized around the world. Um, the one case where that has really been tried, and Jeff knows more about this than I do, is China, and where they have given money to a big, uh, the, the national IC fund, it's called the Big Fund. That hasn't gone particularly well for them, though it has been very successful in other sectors like electric vehicles and, and all kinds of other manufacturing and supply chains. Um, so actually, I'm not sure that the investment model would work well for semiconductor manufacturing itself. These are really big projects. They're dominated by incumbents anyway. But certainly for all the other uh, key industries and for intermediate and other steps down the semiconductor supply chain, I think we need to seriously look at a more investor-focused industrial policy model, and I actually think that is where the policy direction will be going in the next few years. Well, we might observe that there's some uh, kind of elements of the chip industry on a more uh, innovative level that probably have VC backing. I mean, you know, there are people working, for example, in diamonds to be able to do, instead of silicon, for example, it's a better material for the long run, not yet economically viable. Anybody else have any thoughts about the VC model for semiconductors or industrial policy? Um, there, there have been some attempts recently to set up a VC model for uh, semiconductors. I, I've talked to a few of these guys, and you know, I, um, they're connected with kind of some of the usual faces in the Silicon Valley scene. So there is a movement right now in Silicon Valley to. Um, you could say get back to the basics and make the hardware because I think there's a realization um, that all the software progress that we've seen in the past 10 years, the AI, the machine learning, the big data, um, this cannot continue if we don't have the hardware with the processing power to make it happen. 
Um, so one of the problems with the semiconductor industry, this is something that I learned from my time. I, I spent many years in East Asia as a technology journalist. And one of the things that I learned from um, talking, you know, interviewing a lot of um, industrial leaders in these countries is just that, you know, th th these, are, these are products that exist on extremely long life cycles. Like if you're investing in semiconductors, you're putting down billions and billions of dollars over a period of, of five or more years um, to get out your next product line. I mean, most software companies don't operate on that, um, that kind of timeline. And so what will often happen is that since semiconductors are subsidized all over the world, um, you know, say Intel or another company is about to release a semiconductor in the next three years, well, everybody else, you know, the South Koreans, the Taiwanese, um, you know, Holland is another country that has semi-technology. Um, they're going to come into the market at the same time with subsidies, and they're going to often flood the market um, and, and drive down prices so far that these semis become completely unprofitable. So semiconductors as an industry, uh, it's one of the most um, extremely complicated technologies that humans have ever created. And to be able to invest in it and to make it a success um, usually does involve some kind of uh, state backing just to ensure that all those uh, those, those vicious market cycles do not destroy every single market player. So, Dustin, I'm going to go to you for a moment because, you know, you have the security background on this. Um, you know, we definitely have had externalities with our industrial policy. You know, for better or worse, whatever may be laudable goals we had in mind of making chips more available or accessible, um, you know, or our economy in general, we want consumers to have low prices for their devices. I mean, this has been one of the things with the broadband revolution, get connected quick, fast, and cheap. You know, low cost devices, not really thinking about what's inside the device, what's inside of the machinery. So, you know, we have things like um, Apple making a deal with Chinese military fab like YMTC, Yangtze Memory Technologies, or, you know, we have a, a fighter jets, where are they getting their chips from? Is, could they be compromised? I mean, there's the famous case of Supermicro, which was a motherboard uh, infiltrated with a, with a dangerous um, chip or component. So, you know, maybe can you talk about from your perspective and having worked in the government, how hard it is to control for this once you open the door? What are your thoughts about what we see now, U.S. corporations? It's not about America anymore because their business in China is so big. It's about making the Chinese government happy. So what do you have to say about that? Well, primarily the chips, the, during the Chips Act debate, there was heavy lobbying there towards the end by the semi, uh, semiconductor manufacturers uh, to essentially push back on any restrictions uh, to their further uh, investments in China. Um, now, you saw the, the administration just rolled out what, you know, I think is a, is a pretty good, uh, the Commerce Department in terms of uh, restricting some, some higher end capacity chips uh, that could be used for, you know, super, uh, supercomputers, quantum computing, uh, artificial intelligence for military applications. But many of the, the Chinese applications and the, essentially their entire sector is funneled by this, the dual use mindset. So it really is annoying to me uh, when American companies uh, come, you know, with you know, hat in hand for cash, complaining, you know, on one end about IP theft, you know, you name it, from China, you know, taking and, and, and essentially stealing intellectual property or cyber theft, either uh, legally or illegally, and then at the same time, you know, essentially wanting to tap that market where the CCP has done an excellent job of keeping people on the hook for their manufacturing chains, and it's not just in semiconductors. The rare earth mineral market is really, I mean, that is something that, you watch what happens here in the weeks ahead after the party congress meeting, and if she's elected for a third term. Like, there will be adverse reactions from China related to this latest export restriction, and you could start seeing it in markets that we are highly susceptible to that's outside of the semiconductor pathway. And so, you know, same as semiconductors have some of these elements, so do lots of other things. You know, 90% of the U.S. base chemical pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical chemicals are from China and India. And so these are, you know, different supply chains that they like to control those top side levers. And so my only issue has been that we need to be thinking more holistically. And more to what has annoyed me uh, during the chips debate was it went from saying we should be, you know, friend shoring. You know, this idea that we need to be working as uh, essentially economies that have a view of capitalism and Western markets and values that are separate from China together to solve these types of diversification problems that we have in supply chains. Um, but instead it turned into like a political fodder of, 
every single job of manufacturing has to come back to the United States. Listen, I know that is a, is a great political line, and I want as many jobs to come back to the United States as possible, too. But the fact is, we also need to be working to, with our allies to also keep them from being susceptible to China. And so when the Development Finance Corporation, which was literally set up after they were reformed, USAID and OPIC back in 2018, for in terms of our foreign investments to help other countries, one of the ma mandates was to essentially counter China in places like Africa and South America. But you know what they're doing? They're spending money on, no offense to solar panels, but they're spending it on solar panels in sub-Saharan Africa when they need to be spending it on essentially creating diverse supply chains that are helpful to those countries that want to work with a, a stable partner like the United States or the European Union and not China. So, you know, Julius, in your article, you really um, hammered home that Americans, we've been um, uh, really let down by both parties on this issue about security with our industrial policy. And, um, you know, I think I'm curious if you have more optimism for the state level to act here. I mean, some, some issues we expect the feds to act. I mean, but if you look, maybe a week ago, Ron DeSantis adopted an executive order probably the toughest in the nation that says the state government of Florida cannot buy any product that is made by a Chinese government-owned company. And if you look at Florida's um, GDP, which is on the order of Mexico, it's quite substance, quite substantive, state government's quite a big entity. So I'm curious, Julie, is, is do you see that, um, you know, if you have the, what, what are your thoughts about what has to happen to address this problem? I mean, obviously, you have the power of the corporate lobbying, which it doesn't seem that Congress could push back against. They were sort of railroaded in your estimation. Do you see states step, stepping up to fill the gap? Or is that just a, uh, we, we have to make our federal policy work? I mean, that's part of the Constitution. But maybe you have some thoughts on this. Uh, I guess my, my view on that would be, um, I think there actually has been a shift uh, since, since COVID um, revealed our inability to make masks and since Russia's invasion of the Ukraine um, put further pressure on supply chains and essentially revealed, um, again, the sort of futility of the commercial engagement brings peace and democratization strategy. Um, there has been a big shift, uh, particularly among uh, the center left and the Biden world into taking, in my opinion, a much more serious approach to these issues uh, and, you know, ongoing um, interest from at least certain factions of the Republican Party. So what felt like uh, kind of niche positions to me, as I was the one making them five, six, seven years ago, now are increasingly consensus issues. The problem is, are two issues that haven't been addressed. First, you know, now that we're taking strategic sectors seriously, we haven't, again, invited the U.S. investor and finance communities into them, which I would be the first to say that has been part of the problem in the last 30 years, but they can also be a big part of the solution, and I think there is a willingness to engage from that side. Uh, but the second issue, um, we've kind of been doing uh, a, a little bit of industrial policy at the federal level and a few things at the state level. Uh, we haven't integrated those two and most state development agencies are basically set up to compete with each other and sort of fight with each other on who gets the next Amazon headquarters or whatever. Um, and we haven't done a, a it really, not even have we not done a good job, we haven't really done anything at all to integrate and coordinate federal industrial policy efforts with some of the state uh, development efforts that they're already doing. So I think what DeSantis has done here in Florida is a really interesting and good start, but I think there's so much more that could be done with other states and not just as a kind of negative defensive measure, but as a sort of positive proactive measure to bring back more of these capabilities. So, you know, I'm, I think that is sort of the holy grail here. You know, obviously we want to have um, the sticks. We, got, we need the sticks of restrictions where our safety is at stake. But, you know, maybe it's a, a t the, the carrot part is quite challenging. Like what is the real incentives? And, you know, um, Jeff, coming back to you with titanium economy, Interestingly, they're not any, I think the point of the book is that 
this is completely off the radar of policymakers. Like these companies are self-funded, or maybe they have some bank funding, some independent VCs. They're not going to the markets because they're not public. So the most, maybe some of the most important and innovative places to see where we can become resilient are not on the radar. And so I'm curious, maybe you could talk to that. And I think Julius is making a great point here. Maybe you can all think about this. We have this disconnect between the federal and state level on so many levels, especially security, right? So we have this patchwork. Um, so maybe uh, you can tackle that. Oh uh, yeah, well the uh, lots to say there. Uh, the the American industrial system is, I think, patchwork is is the word that you want to use. Um, so you know, I, w I was in Ukraine last May and, and I met with President Zelensky, um, interviewed him, uh, and uh, it was a technolo it was a tech focused interview. Um, one of the things that he told me that w was kind of hilarious, he, he told me, like, hey, you idiots in America and Europe, um, you have this patchy industrial uh, kind of, you know, half, half patchwork of, of various companies doing random things, and once they make stuff, uh, like, you sold it to Russia, you idiots. Like, you sold it to Russia, and then they invaded Ukraine using those same weapons. Um, he made a plea, and he said, please, Clean up your supply chains. Please do not sell semiconductors to Russia. Please, um, you know, sanction th sanction uh, the products that need to be sanctioned, and please build your own industry. Because you know, when you when you don't build good industries, when you can only make one component and not the other, um, you know, you're only going to sell it to the highest buyer rather than keep it at home and, and you know string it together into an actual end product. Um, I, I mean, I think that you know, the just there are so many. I mean, Ukraine is just one aspect of, of this whole um, debate that's going on now, but the major geopolitical crises, um, the major moment that we are now living in uh, really shows that we need a streamlined um, system of industry at home in America. This is not something that is foreign or alien to America. We have always practiced industrial policy. Um, even when I was in China, uh, I, I spoke one time with a, a semiconductor CEO at a big company. I, I asked him, like, so, um, you know, where, like, where do you get your um, inspiration for industry? And he looked at me like I was a total idiot, and he said, I read Alexander Hamilton's biography, and that's where I understand what industrial policy is and the importance of having industry at home um, here in China. Um, so, you know, the entire world is kind of looking at America and thinking, like, why is it that you guys don't have your act together with the hardware, the manufacturing? Why can't you build your own things? And you're, you're giving away free um, secrets, trade secrets, intellectual property. You're just handing it, um, all, you know, all over the world to, to nefarious actors who are not looking out for your best interests. They don't have you um, in their heart. They're acting against you, and they're going to work against you however they can. So, um, uh, you know, America, I think, is unique in a way because when we practice industrial policy, it has tended to happen at the regional and state level. Um, there are numerous... Uh, research centers, uh, research parks and triangles, and uh, industrial parks all over the country um, that have really been dormant in the past 30 years and that are now starting to see this influx of, uh, of, of both capital coming in, but also um, in this sort of post-Silicon Valley world that's emerging where uh, more and more young people, you know, they stick around Silicon Valley for two years, they get the stamp on their CV from Amazon, and then they head back home to, uh, you know, to the research triangle of North Carolina and work for um, another company there bio in biotech, they work for IBM or wherever it might be. Um, this is starting to change the, the demographic and um, the industrial geography of America in many ways. But it's not something necessarily new because these uh, regional industrial centers are the product of the Cold War. This is where we made our, our space shuttles and our components and the, you know, the first chips that went into the Apollo mission and the World War II laboratories. That whole infrastructure is already there and what we're doing now is simply dusting it off and saying, like, why didn't we uh, use this uh, before? Why didn't we think of this? Why did we just manufacture things in China when we can manufacture much better things right here in North Carolina or Wisconsin. So it um, reminds me of something, you know, I, I live in Denmark and there's a very clear industrial policy about ener energy and being energy independent and we actually export energy to other countries and have, have no need of Russian natural gas. So it's been uh, an interesting time, um, but 
you know, notably, I think you've observed about how the Scandinavian nations have been doing this forever. No one's ever thought that, oh, that's big government. You know, it was just very practical. If you want to compete in the, if Germany's your next door neighbor, you have to be smarter. You cannot compete with them on scale. So you have to make a smarter, better technology. So uh, we're coming to the end of our panel here, and we're going to have a break. So I want to just take a moment to thank um, uh, Lincoln Network, Zach and Lauren, Grace, Max, all the work you've done to make so many amazing panels, and also for bringing together these three great panelists today who I've had the pleasure to interview. So um, let's give our panelists a hand. <laughs>